The Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang A Voyage to Lilliput Chapter 1 My father had a small estate in Nottinghamshire, and I was a third of four sons. He sent me to Cambridge at fourteen years old, and after studying there three years, I was bound apprentice to Mr. Bates, a famous surgeon in London. There, as my father now and then sent me small sums of money, I spent them in learning navigation, and other arts useful to those who travel, as I always believed it would be some time or other my fortune to do. Three years after my leaving him, my good master, Mr. Bates, recommended me as ship's surgeon to the Swallow, on which I voyaged three years. When I came back I settled in London, and having taken part of a small house, I married Miss Mary Burton, daughter of Mr. Edmund Burton, hosier. But my good master Bates died two years after, and as I had few friends my business began to fail, and I determined to go again to sea. After several voyages, I accepted an offer from Captain W. Pritchard, master of the Antelope, who was making a voyage to the South Sea. We set sail from Bristol, May 4th, 1699, and our voyage at first was very prosperous. But in our passage to the East Indies, we were driven by a violent storm to the northwest of Van Diamond's land. Twelve of our crew died from hard labor and bad food, and the rest were in a very weak condition. On the 5th of November, the weather being very hazy, the seamen spied a rock within a hundred and twenty yards of the ship, but the wind was so strong that we were driven straight upon it, and immediately split. Six of the crew, of whom I was one, letting down the boat, got clear of the ship, and we rowed about three leagues, till we could work no longer. We therefore trusted ourselves to the mercy of the waves, and in about half an hour the boat was upset by a sudden squall. What became of my companions in the boat, or those who escaped on the rock, or were left in the vessel, I cannot tell, but I conclude they were all lost. For my part I swam as fortune directed me, and was pushed forward by wind and tide, but when I was able to struggle no longer I found myself within my depth. By this time the storm was much abated. I reached the shore at last, about eight o'clock in the evening, and advanced nearly half a mile inland, but could not discover any sign of inhabitants. I was extremely tired, and with the heat of the weather I found myself much inclined to sleep. I lay down on the grass, which was very short and soft, and slept sounder than ever I did in my life for about nine hours. When I woke, it was just daylight. I attempted to rise, but could not, for as I happened to be lying on my back, I found my arms and legs were fastened on each side to the ground, and my hair, which was long and thick, tied down in the same manner. I could only look upward. The sun began to grow hot, and the light hurt my eyes. I heard a confused noise about me, but could see nothing except the sky. In a little time I felt something alive and moving on my left leg, which advancing gently over my breast, came almost up to my chin, when bending my eyes downward I perceived it to be a human creature, not six inches high, with a bow and arrow in his hands, and a quiver at his back. In the meantime I felt at least forty more following the first. I was in the utmost astonishment, and roared so loud that they all ran back in a fright, and some of them were hurt with the falls they got by leaping from my sides upon the ground. However, they soon returned, and one of them, who ventured so far as to get a full sight of my face, lifted up his hands in admiration. I lay all this while in great uneasiness, but at length, struggling to get loose, I succeeded in breaking the strings that fastened my left arm to the ground, and at the same time, with a violent pull that gave me extreme pain, I a little loosened the strings that tied down my hair, so that I was just able to turn my head about two inches. But the creatures ran off a second time before I could seize them, 
whereupon there was a great shout, and in an instant I felt above a hundred arrows discharged on my left hand, which pricked me like so many needles. Moreover, they shot another flight into the air, of which some fell on my face, which I immediately covered with my left hand. When this shower of arrows was over, I groaned with grief and pain, and then, striving again to get loose, they discharged another flight of arrows, larger than the first, and some of them tried to stab me with their spears. But by good luck I had on a leather jacket, which they could not pierce. By this time I thought it most prudent to lie still till night, when, my left hand being already loose, I could easily free myself, and as for the inhabitants, I thought I might be a match for the greatest army they could bring against me if they were all of the same size as him I saw. When the people observed that I was quiet, they discharged no more arrows, but by the noise I heard, I knew that their numbers was increased. And about four yards from me, for more than an hour, there was a knocking, like people at work. Then turning my head that way as well as the pegs and strings would let me, I saw a stage set up, about a foot and a half from the ground, with two or three ladders to mount it. From this one of them, who seemed to be a person of quality, made me a long speech, of which I could not understand a word, though I could tell from his manner that he sometimes threatened me, and sometimes spoke with pity and kindness. I answered in few words, but in the most submissive manner, and being almost famished with hunger, I could not help showing my impatience by putting my finger frequently to my mouth, to signify that I wanted food. He understood me very well, and descending from the stage, commanded that several ladders should be set against my sides, on which more than a hundred of the inhabitants mounted, and walked toward my mouth with baskets full of food, which had been sent by the king's order, when the first received tidings of me. There were legs and shoulders like mutton, but smaller than the wings of a lark. I ate them two or three at a mouthful, and took three loaves at a time. They supplied me as fast as they could, with a thousand marks of wonder at my appetite. I then made a sign that I wanted something to drink. They guessed that a small quantity would not suffice me, and being a most ingenious people, they slung up one of their largest hogsheads, then rolled it toward my hand, and beat out the top. I drank it off at a draught, which I might well do, for it did not hold half a pint. They brought me a second hogshead, which I drank, and made signs for more, but they had none to give me. However, I could not wonder enough at the daring of these tiny mortals, who ventured to mount and walk upon my body, while one of my hands was free, without trembling at the very sight of so huge a creature as I must have seemed to them. After some time there appeared before me a person of high rank from His Imperial Majesty. His Excellency, having mounted my right leg, advanced to my face, with about a dozen of his retinue, and spoke about ten minutes, often pointing forward, which, as I afterward found, was toward the capital city, about half a mile distant, whither it was commanded by His Majesty that I should be conveyed. I made a sign with my hand that was loose, putting it to the other but over his excellency's head, for fear of hurting him or his train, to show that I desired my liberty. He seemed to understand me well enough, for he shook his head, though he made other signs to let me know that I should have meat and drink enough, and very good treatment. Then I once thought of attempting to escape, but when I felt the smart of their arrows on my face and hands, which were all in blisters, and observed likewise that the number of my enemies increased, I gave tokens to let them know that they might do with me what they pleased. Then they daubed my face and hands with a sweet-smelling ointment, which in a few minutes removed all the smarts of the arrows. The relief from pain and hunger made me drowsy, and presently I fell asleep. I slept about eight hours, as I was told afterward, and it was no wonder, for the physicians, by the Emperor's orders, had mingled a sleeping draught in the hogsheads of wine. It seems that, when I was discovered sleeping on the ground, after my landing, the Emperor had early notice of it, and determined that I should be tied in the manner I have related, which was done in the night while I slept, that plenty of meat and drink should be sent me, 
and a machine prepared to carry me to the capital city. Five hundred carpenters and engineers were immediately set to work to prepare the engine. It was a frame of wood, raised three inches from the ground, about seven feet long and four feet wide, moving upon twenty-two wheels. But the difficulty was to place me on it. Eighty poles were erected for this purpose, and very strong cords fastened to bandages, which the workmen had tied round my neck, hands, body, and legs. Nine hundred of the strongest men were employed to draw up these cords by pulleys fastened on the poles, and in less than three hours I was raised and slung into the engine, and there tied fast. Fifteen hundred of the emperor's largest horses, each about four inches and a half high, were then employed to draw me toward the capital. But while all this was done, I still lay in a deep sleep, and I did not wake till four hours after we began our journey. The emperor and all his court came out to meet us when we reached the capital. But his great officials would not suffer his majesty to risk his person by mounting on my body. Where the carriage stopped there stood an ancient temple, supposed to be the largest in the whole kingdom, and here it was determined that I should lodge. Near the great gate, through which I could easily creep, they fixed ninety-one chains like those which hung to a lady's watch, which were locked to my left leg with thirty-six padlocks, and when the workmen found it was impossible for me to break loose, they cut all the strings that bound me. Then I rose up, feeling as melancholy as ever I did in my life, but the noise and astonishment of the people on seeing me rise and walk were inexpressible. The chains that held my left leg were about two yards long, and gave me not only freedom to walk backward and forward in a semicircle, but to creep in and lie at full length inside the temple. The emperor, advancing toward me from among the courtiers, all most magnificently clad, surveyed me with great admiration, but kept beyond the length of my chain. He was taller by about the breadth of my nail than any of his court, which alone was enough to strike awe into the beholders, and graceful and majestic. The better to behold him, I lay down on my side, so that my face was level with his, and he stood three yards off. However, I have had him since many times in my hand, and therefore cannot be deceived. His dress was very simple, but he wore a light helmet of gold, adorned with jewels and a plume. He held his sword drawn in his hand, to defend himself if I should break loose. It was almost three inches long, and the hilt was of gold, enriched with diamonds. His voice was shrill, but very clear. His imperial majesty spoke often to me, and I answered, but neither of us could understand a word. CHAPTER Two. After about two hours the court retired, and I was left with a strong guard to keep away the crowd, some of whom had had the impudence to shoot their arrows at me as I sat by the door of my house. But the colonel ordered six of them to be seized and delivered bound into my hands. I put five of them into my coat pocket, and as to the sixth, I made a face as if I would eat him alive. The poor man screamed terribly, and the colonel and his officers were much distressed, especially when they saw me take out my penknife. But I soon set them at ease, for cutting the strings he was bound with, I put him gently on the ground, and away he ran. I treated the rest in the same manner, taking them one by one out of my pocket, and I saw that both the soldiers and people were delighted at this mark of my kindness. Toward night I got with some difficulty into my house, where I lay on the ground, as I had to do for a fortnight, till a bed was prepared for me out of six hundred beds of the ordinary measure. Six hundred servants were appointed me, and three hundred tailors made me a suit of clothes. Moreover, six of His Majesty's greatest scholars were employed to teach me their language, so that soon I was able to converse after a fashion with the Emperor, who often honoured me with his visits. The first words I learned were to desire that he would please to give me my liberty, which I every day repeated on my knees. But he answered that this must be a work of time, and that first I must swear a peace with him and his kingdom. He told me also that by the laws of the nation I must be searched by two of his officers, 
and that, as this could not be done without my help, he trusted them in my hands, and whatever they took from me should be returned when I left the country. I took up the two officers and put them into my coat pockets. These gentlemen, having pen, ink, and paper about them, made an exact list of everything they saw, which I afterward translated into English, and which ran as follows. In the right coat pocket of the great man mountain, we found only one great piece of coarse cloth, large enough to cover the carpet of your majesty's chief room of state. In the left pocket we saw a huge silver chest, with a silver cover, which we could not lift. We desired that it should be opened, and one of us stepping into it found himself up to the mid-leg in a sort of dust, some of which flying into our faces sent us both into a fit of sneezing. In his right waistcoat pocket, we found a number of white thin substances, folded one over another, about the size of three men, tied with a strong cable, and marked with black figures, which we humbly conceived to be writings. In the left there was a sort of engine, from the back of which extended twenty long poles, with which, we conjecture, the man-mountain combs his head. In the smaller pocket, on the right side, were several round flat pieces of white and red metal of different sizes. Some of the white, which appeared to be silver, were so large and heavy that my comrade and I could hardly lift them. From another pocket hung a huge silver chain, with a wonderful kind of engine fastened to it, a globe half silver and half of some transparent metal, for on the transparent side we saw certain strange figures, and thought we could touch them till we found our fingers stopped by the shining substance. This engine made an incessant noise, like a water-mill, and we conjecture it is either some unknown animal, or the god he worships, but probably the latter, as he told us that he seldom did anything without consulting it. This is a list of what we found about the body of the man-mountain who treated us with great civility. I had one private pocket, which escaped their search, containing a pair of spectacles and a small spy-glass, which, being of no consequence to the Emperor, I did not think myself bound in honour to discover. CHAPTER Three. My gentleness and good behaviour gained so far on the Emperor and his court, and indeed on the people in general, that I began to have hopes of getting my liberty in a short time. The natives came by degrees to be less fearful of danger from me. I would sometimes lie down and let five or six of them dance on my hand, and at last the boys and girls ventured to come and play at hide-and-seek in my hair. The horses of the army and of the royal stables were no longer shy, having been daily led before me, and one of the emperor's huntsmen on a large corsair took my foot, shoe and all, which was indeed a prodigious leap. I amused the Emperor one day in a very extraordinary manner. I took nine sticks and fixed them firmly in the ground in a square. Then I took four other sticks and tied them parallel at each corner, about two feet from the ground. I fastened my handkerchief to the nine sticks that stood erect and extended it on all sides till it was as tight as the top of a drum, and I desired the Emperor to let a troop of his best horse, twenty-four in number, come and exercise upon this plain. His Majesty approved of the proposal, and I took them up one by one, with the proper officers to exercise them. As soon as they got into order, they divided into two parties, discharged blunt arrows, drew their swords, fled and pursued, and in short showed the best military discipline I ever beheld. The parallel sticks secured them and their horses from falling off the stage, and the Emperor was so much delighted that he ordered this entertainment to be repeated several days, and persuaded the Empress herself to let me hold her in her chair within two yards of the stage, whence she could view the whole performance. Fortunately no accident happened. Only once a fiery horse, pawing with his hoof, struck a hole in my handkerchief, and overthrew his rider and himself but I immediately relieved them both, and covering the hole with my hand, I set down the troop with the other as I had taken them up. The horse that fell was strained in the shoulder, but the rider was not hurt, and I repaired my handkerchief as well as I could. However, I would not trust to the strength of it any more in such dangerous enterprises. I had sent so many petitions for my liberty that His Majesty at length mentioned the matter in a full council, 
where it was opposed by none except Skyrish Bolgolam, admiral of the realm, who was pleased without any provocation to be my mortal enemy. However, he agreed at length, though he succeeded in himself drawing up the conditions on which I should be set free. After they were read, I was requested to swear to perform them in the method prescribed by their laws, which was to hold my right foot in my left hand, and to place the middle finger of my right hand on the crown of my head, and my thumb on the top of my right ear. But I have made a translation of the conditions which I here offer to the public. Golbaste, Mamarine, Evelom, Gerdile, Shafim, Muli, Uli, Gu, Most Mighty Emperor of Lilliput, Delight and Terror of the Universe, Whose Dominions Extend to the Ends of the Globe, Monarch of all Monarchs, Taller than the Sons of Men, Whose Feet Press Down to the Center, And Whose Head Strikes Against the Sun, at whose nod the princes of the earth shake their knees, pleasant as the spring, comfortable as the summer, fruitful as autumn, dreadful as winter. His most sublime majesty proposeth to the man-mountain, lately arrived at our celestial dominions, the following articles, which by a solemn oath he shall be obliged to perform. First, the man-mountain shall not depart from our dominions without our license under the great seal. Second, he shall not presume to come into our metropolis without our express order, at which time the inhabitants shall have two hours' warning to keep within doors. Third, the said man-mountain shall confine his walks to our principal high-roads, and not offer to walk or lie down in a meadow or field of corn. Fourth, as he walks the said roads, he shall take the utmost care not to trample upon the bodies of any of our loving subjects, their horses or carriages, nor take any of our subjects into his hands without their own consent. Fifth, if an express requires extraordinary speed, the man-mountain shall be obliged to carry in his pocket the messenger and horse a six days' journey, and return the said messenger, if so required, safe to our imperial presence. Sixth, he shall be our ally against our enemies in the island of Blefuscu, and do his utmost to destroy their fleet, which is now preparing to invade us. Lastly, upon his solemn oath to observe all the above articles, the said man-mountain shall have a daily allowance of meat and drink sufficient for the support of 1,724 of our subjects, with free access to our royal person, and other marks of our favor given at our palace at Belfaruic, the twelfth day of the ninety-first moon of our reign. I swore to these articles with great cheerfulness, whereupon my chains were immediately unlocked, and I was at full liberty. One morning, about a fortnight after I had obtained my freedom, Reldrasol, the emperor's secretary for private affairs, came to my house, attended only by one servant. He ordered his coach to wait at a distance, and desired that I should give him an hour's audience. I offered to lie down, that he might the more conveniently reach my ear, but he chose rather to let me hold him in my hand during our conversation. He began with compliments on my liberty, but he added that, save for the present state of things at court, perhaps I might not have obtained it so soon. For, he said, however flourishing we may seem to foreigners, we are in danger of an invasion from the island of Blefuscu, which is the other great empire of the universe, almost as large and as powerful as this of his majesty. For as to what we have heard you say, that there are other kingdoms in the world, inhabited by human creatures as large as yourself, our philosophers are very doubtful, and rather conjecture that you dropped from the moon, or one of the stars." Perhaps a hundred mortals of your size would soon destroy all the fruit and cattle of His Majesty's dominions. Besides, our histories of six thousand moons make no mention of any other regions than the two mighty empires of Lilliput and Blefuscu, which, as I was going to tell you, are engaged in a most obstinate war, which began in the following manner. It is allowed on all hands that the primitive way of breaking eggs was upon the larger end, but his present majesty's grandfather, while he was a boy, going to eat an egg, and breaking it according to the ancient practice, happened to cut one of his fingers, 
whereupon the emperor his father made a law commanding all his subjects to break the smaller end of their eggs the people so highly resented this law that there have been six rebellions raised on the account wherein one emperor lost his life and another his crown it is calculated that eleven hundred persons have at different times suffered rather than break their eggs at the smaller end but these rebels the big endians have found so much encouragement at the emperor of blefuscu's court to which they always fled for refuge that a bloody war as i said has been carried on between the two empires for six and thirty moons and now the blefuscudians have equipped a large fleet and are preparing to descend upon us therefore his imperial majesty placing great confidence in your valor and strength has commanded me to set the case before you i desired the secretary to present my humble duty to the emperor and to let him know that i was ready at the risk of my life to defend him against all invaders it was not long before i communicated to his majesty the plan i formed for seizing the enemy's whole fleet the empire of blefuscu is an island parted from lilliput only by a channel eight hundred yards wide i consulted the most experienced seamen on the depth of the channel and they told me that in the middle at high water it was seventy glumguffs about six feet of european measure i walked toward the coast where lying down behind a hillock i took out my spy-glass and viewed the enemy's fleet at anchor about fifty men of war and other vessels i then came back to my house and gave orders for a great quantity of the strongest cables and bars of iron the cable was about as thick as pack-thread and the bars of the length and size of a knitting-needle i troubled the cable to make it stronger and for the same reason twisted three of the iron bars together bending the ends into a hook having thus fixed fifty hooks to as many cables I went back to the coast, and taking off my coat, shoes, and stockings, walked into the sea, in my leather jacket, about half an hour before high water. I waded, with what haste I could, swimming in the middle, about thirty yards, till I felt ground, and thus arrived at the fleet, in less than half an hour. The enemy was so frightened, when they saw me, that they leaped out of their ships and swam ashore, where there could not be fewer than thirty thousand. Then, fastening a hook to the hole at the prow of each ship, I tied all the cords together at the end. Meanwhile, the enemy discharged several thousand arrows, many of which stuck in my hands and face. My greatest fear was for my eyes, which I should have lost if I had not suddenly thought of the pair of spectacles which had escaped the Emperor's searchers. These I took out and fastened upon my nose, and thus armed went on with my work in spite of the arrows many of which struck against the glasses of my spectacles, but without any other effect than slightly disturbing them. Then, taking the knot in my hand, I began to pull, but not a ship would stir, for they were too fast held by their anchors. Thus the boldest part of my enterprise remained. Letting go the cord, I resolutely cut with my knife the cables that fastened the anchors, receiving more than two hundred shots in the face and hands. Then I took up again the knotted end of the cables, to which my hooks were tied, and with great ease drew fifty of the enemy's largest men of war after me. When the Blefuscudians saw the fleet moving in order, and me pulling at the end, they set up a scream of grief and despair that it is impossible to describe. When I had got out of danger, I stopped a while to pick out the arrows that stuck in my hands and face, and rubbed on some of the same ointment that was given me at my arrival. I then took off my spectacles, and after waiting about an hour, till the tide was a little fallen, I waded on to the royal port of Lilliput. The emperor and his whole court stood on the shore awaiting me. They saw the ships move forward in a large half-moon, but could not discern me, who, in the middle of the channel, was under water up to my neck. The emperor concluded that I was drowned, and that the enemy's fleet was approaching in a hostile manner. But he was soon set at ease, for the channel growing shallower every step I made, I came in a short time within hearing, and holding up the end of the cable by which the fleet was fastened, I cried in a loud voice, Long live the most puissant emperor of Lilliput! The prince received me at my landing with all possible joy, and made me a nardle on the spot, 
which is the highest title of honor among them. His Majesty desired that I would take some opportunity to bring all the rest of his enemy's ships into his ports, and seemed to think of nothing less than conquering the whole empire of Blefuscu, and becoming the sole monarch of the world. But I plainly protested that I would never be the means of bringing a free and brave people into slavery, and though the wisest of the ministers were of my opinion, my open refusal was so opposed to His Majesty's ambition that he would never forgive me, and from this time a plot began between himself and those of his ministers who were my enemies that nearly ended in my utter destruction. About three weeks after this exploit there arrived an embassy from Blefuscu with humble offers of peace, which was soon concluded on terms very advantageous to our emperor. There were six ambassadors with a train of about five hundred persons, all very magnificent. Having been privately told that I had befriended them, they made me a visit, and paying me many compliments on my valor and generosity, invited me to their kingdom in the emperor their master's name. I asked them to present my most humble respects to the emperor their master, whose royal person I resolved to attend before I returned to my own country. Accordingly, the next time I had the honor to see our emperor, I desired his general permission to visit the Blefuscudian monarch. This he granted me, but in a very cold manner, of which I afterward learned the reason. When I was just preparing to pay my respects to the Emperor of Blefuscu, a distinguished person at court, to whom I had once done a great service, came to my house very privately at night, and without sending his name, desired admission. I put his lordship into my coat pocket, and giving orders to a trusty servant to admit no one, I fastened the door placed my visitor on the table, and sat down by it. His lordship's face was full of trouble, and he asked me to hear him with patience, in a matter that highly concerned my honor and my life. "'You are aware,' he said, "'that Skyresh Bolgolam has been your mortal enemy ever since your arrival, and his hatred is increased since your great success against Blefuscu, by which his glory as admiral is obscured.' This lord and others have accused you of treason, and several counsels have been called in the most private manner on your account. Out of gratitude for your favors, I procured information of the whole proceedings, venturing my head for your service, and this was the charge against you. First, that you, having brought the imperial fleet of Blefuscu into the royal port, were commanded by his majesty to seize all the other ships, and put to death all the Bigendian exiles, and also all the people of the empire who would not immediately consent to break their eggs at the smaller end, and that, like a false traitor to his most serene majesty, you excused yourself from the service on pretense of unwillingness to force the consciences and destroy the liberties and lives of an innocent people. Again, when ambassadors arrived from the court of Blefuscu, like a false traitor, you aided and entertained them, though you knew them to be servants of a prince lately in open war against his imperial majesty. Moreover, you are now preparing, contrary to the duty of a faithful subject, to voyage to the court of Blefuscu. In the debate on this charge, my friend continued, his majesty often urged the services you have done him, while the admiral and treasurer insisted that you should be put to a shameful death. But Reldrizel, secretary for private affairs, who has always proved himself your friend, suggested that if his majesty would please to spare your life, and only give orders to put out both your eyes, justice might in some measure be satisfied. At this, Bolgolum rose up in fury, wondering how the secretary dared to desire to preserve the life of a traitor, and the treasurer, pointing out the expense of keeping you, also urged your death. But his majesty was graciously pleased to say that since the council thought the loss of your eyes too easy a punishment, some other might afterward be inflicted. And the secretary, humbly desiring to be heard again, said that, as to expense your allowance, might be gradually lessened, so that, for want of sufficient food, you should grow weak and faint, and die in a few months, when His Majesty's subjects might cut your flesh from your bones and bury it, leaving the skeleton for the admiration of posterity. Thus, through the great friendship of the secretary, the affair was arranged. It was commanded— that the plan of starving you by degrees should be kept a secret, but the sentence of putting out your eyes was entered on the books. 
In three days your friend the secretary will come to your house and read the accusation before you, and point out the great mercy of his majesty that only condones you to the loss of your eyes, which he does not doubt you will submit to humbly and gratefully. Twenty of his majesty's surgeons will attend to see the operation well performed by discharging very sharp-pointed arrows into the balls of your eyes as you lie on the ground. I leave you, said my friend, to consider what measures you will take, and to escape suspicion I must immediately return as secretly as I came. His lordship did so, and I remained alone, in great perplexity. At first I was bent on resistance, for while I had liberty I could easily, with stones, pelt the metropolis to pieces, but I soon rejected that idea with horror, remembering the oath I had made to the emperor, and the favors I had received from him. At last, having his majesty's leave to pay my respects to the emperor of Blefuscu, I resolved to take this opportunity. Before the three days had passed, I wrote a letter to my friend, the secretary, telling him of my resolution, and without waiting for an answer, went to the coast, and entering the channel, between wading and swimming, reached the port of Blefuscu, where the people, who had long expected me, led me to the capital. His majesty, with the royal family and great officers of the court, came out to receive me, and they entertained me in a manner suited to the generosity of so great a prince. I did not, however, mention my disgrace with the Emperor of Lilliput, since I did not suppose that prince would disclose the secret while I was out of his power. But in this, it soon appeared, I was deceived. CHAPTER V Three days after my arrival, walking out of curiosity to the northeast coast of the island, I observed at some distance in the sea something that looked like a boat overturned. I pulled off my shoes and stockings, and wading two or three hundred yards, I plainly saw it to be a real boat, which I supposed might, by some tempest, have been driven from a ship. I returned immediately to the city for help, and after a huge amount of labor, I managed to get my boat to the royal port of Blefuscu, where a great crowd of people appeared, full of wonder at sight of so prodigious a vessel. I told the emperor that my good fortune had thrown this boat in my way to carry me to some place whence I might return to my native country, and begged his orders for materials to fit it up, and leave to depart, which, after many kindly speeches, he was pleased to grant. Meanwhile, the emperor of Lilliput, uneasy at my long absence, but never imagining that I had the least notice of his designs, sent a person of rank to inform the emperor of Blefuscu of my disgrace. This messenger had orders to represent the great mercy of his master, who was content to punish me with the loss of my eyes, and who expected that his brother of Blefuscu would have me sent back to Lilliput, bound hand and foot, to be punished as a traitor. The emperor of Blefuscu answered with many civil excuses. He said that as for sending me bound, his brother knew it was impossible. Moreover, though I had taken away his fleet, he was grateful to me for many good offices I had done him in making the peace, but that both their majesties would soon be made easy, for I had found a prodigious vessel on the shore, able to carry me on the sea, which he had given orders to fit up, and he hoped in a few weeks both empires would be free from me. With this answer the messenger returned to Lilliput, and I, though the monarch of Blefuscu secretly offered me his gracious protection, if I would continue in his service, hastened my departure, resolving never more to put confidence in princes. In about a month I was ready to take leave. The emperor of Blefuscu, with the empress and the royal family, came out of the palace, and I lay down on my face to kiss their hands, which they graciously gave me. His Majesty presented me with fifty purses of sprugs, their greatest gold coin, and his picture at full length, which I put immediately into one of my gloves, to keep it from being hurt. Many other ceremonies took place at my departure. I stored the boat with meat and drink, and took six cows and two bulls alive, with as many ewes and rams, intending to carry them into my own country, and to feed them on board. I had a good bundle of hay and a bag of corn. I would gladly have taken a dozen of the natives, but this was a thing the emperor would by no means permit, and besides a diligent search into my pockets, his majesty pledged my honor not to carry away any of his subjects, though with their own consent and desire. Having thus prepared all things as well as I was able, I set sail. When I had made twenty-four leagues, by my reckoning, from the island of Blefuscu, I saw a sail steering to the northeast. 
I hailed her, but could get no answer, yet I found I gained upon her, for the wind slackened, and in half an hour she spied me and discharged a gun. I came up with her between five and six in the evening, September 26, 1701, but my heart leaped within me to see her English colors. I put my cows and sheep into my coat pockets, and got on board with all my little cargo. The captain received me with kindness, and asked me to tell him what place I came from last, but at my answer he thought I was raving. However, I took my black cattle and sheep out of my pocket, which, after great astonishment, clearly convinced him. We arrived in England on the 13th of April, 1702. I stayed two months with my wife and family, but my eager desire to see foreign countries would suffer me to remain no longer. However, while in England, I made great profit by showing my cattle to persons of quality and others. And before I began my second voyage, I sold them for six hundred pounds. I left fifteen hundred pounds with my wife, and fixed her in a good house. Then, taking leave of her and my boy and girl, with tears on both sides, I sailed on board the adventure. Begin note. Swift. End note. End of A Voyage to Lilliput from the Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang.